How are we? A little bit quiet, a little bit cool. Well, let me chuck that over there. Next slide. We're going to have some fun this morning. (laughs) Well, feeding the 5,000 has to be one of those great stories, doesn't it? I mean, next to Jesus turning water into wine, this has got to be the best party trick that I've ever heard of. I mean, who wouldn't love a party with Jesus there? You'd have unlimited wine and the best wine, the Scriptures tell us. And you would also have all the fish and loaves that you would want. Now, I don't know about you, but I get sick of fish after a while, so maybe it wouldn't be so great. I remember one trip, I spent two weeks sailing the Whit Sundays, eating fish and just fish. Got back to shore and all I wanted was a steak. Steak. When I got to the clubhouse, got their biggest steak. It was like this big. It was great. Completely irrelevant. It's not what we're talking about this morning. (laughs) Jesus himself even acknowledges the danger of people seeking him for such things. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Feeding the 5,000 is a miracle, no doubt, but it was more than this. In this story are a number of just amazing take-home lessons. Number one, it's God's economy, isn't it? He multiplies our efforts. That's a clear lesson in this story. It's a lesson in humility. He corrected the disciples, didn't he? He put them on track. This is what you should be doing. This is what faith's all about. And third thing, it's a lesson in compassion. Well, this week I got the big wheel out and I put on it the three things, God's economy, humility, compassion, gave it a spin because I can't preach on all three this morning. I do want us to go home for lunch and next week we can stay for lunch. But this week I spun the wheel and what come up? Compassion. I've preached this passage a number of times. It's the first time that I thought about it in terms of compassion. Compassion is what we're focusing on today. The compassion we see in Christ, the compassion that he demonstrates and the lack of compassion that these disciples, these followers of Jesus have, what he rebukes them for. Well, before we pray and get stuck into Matthew 14, I have to admit that this isn't a hot button topic, is it? Are we on the edge of our seats, like desperate to understand compassion? Are we all sitting there, what's Michael gonna say next? Is he gonna talk about one of those things, contentious that will get our church a reputation? He's just gonna talk about compassion. How boring. I mean, we all know that compassion is a good thing, but there's often a noose around our neck, isn't it? When we see the needs and we don't meet them and we think, I'm just not compassionate or I'm not good enough. It's, we hear that people get compassion fatigue, that they just give too much and they burn out a wreck in the corner. All I ask this morning is we just gotta withhold whatever we think about this idea of compassion And just let the scriptures guide us, see where they take us. So I better pray before I tell you a story about my wife. (laughs) Lord, thank you for your great love. Open our hearts and minds this morning. Bless us, Jesus. Amen. Well, my wife, Ali, she is crazy compassionate. I don't know if you've noticed, she is so compassionate and it drives me nuts. Oh my goodness. She has no regard for our budget when it comes to being compassionate. No thought for herself and her own needs. She just does it over and over again. And the worst thing about this is I knew this when we met. Sadly, compassion is desperately attractive, isn't it? Compassionate people are just somehow attractive. I couldn't hold back. Now, this hasn't stopped me trying to temper her compassion, trying to get her to slow down a little bit and not rescue the next dove she sees on the side of the road or whatever it might be. I'm only half joking, by the way. Seriously, I think I'd get along really well with our disciples, the disciples in our story this morning. When they're asked to feed the people, to be compassion, compassionate, they respond without kind of batting an eyelid. They immediately do what I do. They weigh up the cost and they discover, well, we just don't have enough. And they go, nope, can't do it, Jesus. Let's not get ahead of ourselves because compassion's a virtue. We know this and it's really attractive. We know it's a good thing, but how difficult is it? I mean, our disciples, they've been hearing all about what it means to serve others. 
Jesus' kingdom is upside down, isn't it, from the world around us? That we find our life in self-sacrifice, in the giving and serving of others. He's been teaching them to turn the other cheek when they're, when, when they're attacked. He's been teaching them to pray for their enemies, to love others. And these, they've seen the miracles. What Jesus was prepared to give of himself in order to meet people's needs. And they still don't get it. Let's have a look. Matthew 14, verse 13. Now Jesus heard this. Now this, what he heard was the news of his cousin's death. John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod. Herod was taken in by this pretty girl at a party, followed through with it, murdered his friend. Hearing this news, Jesus withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place, all by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion for them and cured their sick. I've actually got three steps, three steps in order to how we can be more compassionate from today's scriptures. And first thing is to be selfless. If you want to be more compassionate, you've got to be selfless. Jesus' friend had died. He was seeking a moment to grieve, to, to kind of sit back and pray and, and just, just be himself for a moment. But he saw the needs of the cat, crowds. He had compassion on them. He was selfless. He put his needs to one side and got to work. Again, put a pin in that because I think we should spend a bit of time before we go any further defining what it means to be compassionate. What does it mean to be compassionate? Now, I've been preaching at you now for what, three or four minutes, five minutes? I need to teach as well. And teaching requires a bit of interaction. So I need your help. I've got three questions. What is sympathy? I think I've got a slide. Actually, I'll put the slide up in a minute. What is sympathy? Anyone have a go? Yes. Feeling sorry for someone? someone? Yeah. Anyone got a better definition or anything different? Pretty good. Sympathy is just to have a level of concern for someone else's needs. And, you know, the need has been noticed, acknowledged even, but sympathy's at arm's length, isn't it? Often sympathy's a bit more of a go for it. You'll be okay. Suck it up, princess, even. You know, that's what one of my training rectors used to say to me when I complained. Rarely is sympathy anything more than a platitude. In fact, for the most part, when we receive sympathy from someone else, it's it's almost offensive. It's judgmental. We feel judged. Now, empathy, though, empathy is much better. What is empathy? Anyone want to go at that one? Walking alongside? Yeah, anyone else want to have a go at what empathy might be? Putting yourself in their shoes. Putting yourself in their shoes. I think we've touched it both on there. Empathy is to feel what the other person is feeling. It's to kind of identify with them, to walk in their shoes as best we can. You've got a sore back, I've got a sore back. We come alongside, we feel them. And when we do this well, when we are empathetic and we genuinely have empathy, people feel heard. They feel validated rather than judged. But what about compassion? Compassion literally means... What is it? Acting it out? Yeah. Anything more? Nearly, we can do better. Come on, John, we can do, yep. Say it again. Meeting their needs. If you did a dictionary search and looked up what does does compassion mean, it means to suffer together. We're almost touching it, aren't we? Compassion is more than just meeting their need. It's actually to suffer together, which means that compassion is much more powerful than sympathy or even empathy To have compassion is to have skin in the game. It's to literally get into their situation, that is with the person who is suffering, to not only feel what they feel, but to experience the hardship with them. Let me summarise. Sympathy usually makes a person feel judged. 
I'm not saying sympathy is wrong, but normally that's the response when people just give us sympathy but stay at arm's length. It's kind of like, well, that's helpful. Thanks for nothing. Empathy is helpful. That people feel heard. They feel validated. And compassion, well, it makes a person feel valuable. It makes them feel like they're important like they matter. Most of all, compassion makes people feel love. So compassion is a tough ask, yeah? No wonder the disciples fail miserably. Have a look at verse 15. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Hooray for the disciples. They've noticed that these people have a need. They're hungry and the need is unmet. But is this sympathy, empathy or compassion? It's sympathy. I think it's sympathy. It's definitely sympathy. At best, it's sympathy. But at the worst, it's actually quite selfish, isn't it? We don't have enough to go around. Send them packing, Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, what about Jesus? Remember where we're at in the story? Jesus would have been desperately exhausted. Not only was he unable to withdraw and process the news of his friend's death, to pray and to grieve. And yes, Jesus was fully human. We've been doing this in the kids' talks. He laughed, he cried, he slept, he got angry. Yes, he was fully God as well. He died, he rose again from the dead. He'll be present at the end of the age. None of this takes away from his own needs, from his willingness to be with us, to have compassion on us, to suffer with us. For if Jesus was just faking it, then it would just be meaningless, wouldn't it? This is something Jesus never does. But Michael, the disciples couldn't possibly know how to feed 5,000 people. That's just ridiculous, isn't it? Surely this is not a matter of compassion. It's just a matter of logic and logistics. Well, no, it's not. To answer my own question to myself. This isn't about logical logistics. It's about compassion because compassionate people do not count the cost. Step one, be selfless. Step two, do not count the cost. If we want to be compassionate people, we must act in a way that does not count the cost. Unlike our disciples who spoke up because they were worried they would have to go without. Poor didums. And to this Jesus says, the crowd need not go away. You give them something to eat. See what I mean? Jesus says, don't count the cost. Have compassion on them. Give them what you have. To this they replied, we have nothing but five loaves and two fish. They fail again. They count the cost. Surprise, surprise, they come up lacking. This is a failure on so many levels. But I expect some of us are still scratching our heads. It's impossible. You might be thinking as I was when I read this, it's just impossible. And I was also thinking, how are they to know that God would do a miracle? Surely he wasn't expecting them to starve in order to demonstrate their compassion. But then I realized that I too was simply counting the cost, counting the cost. Seriously, this is Jesus. Do we really think that he would not have their back if they were to be truly selfless, truly compassionate? Do we think that Jesus wouldn't have our back in that moment as well? I mean, do we know how many Bible verses there are, how many passages about God providing everything we need? Does anybody know how many there are? I tried to work it out this week and I just kept finding them so I thought I'll ask the AI didn't I chat GPT how many passages about 
God providing our needs are there in the Bible? It's a difficult question to answer. There's too many. Seriously, that's the answer I got. There's too many. I tried counting them. I tried looking at them. There are hundreds and hundreds. It is right through the Gospels. Let me just grab one from a few chapters earlier in Matthew's Gospel. I'm going to read it quick. It's a big bit of text, but I'm, and I know you've heard it before. Therefore, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, do not worry about your life, that you will, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your lifespan? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed by like one of these. But if God so clothes the grasses of the field, which are alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So Jesus is seeing if they get it. And they don't, do they? They fail miserably. And if we count the cost, if our compassion relies on us counting the cost, if our compassion can only extend from our excess, if we worry about ourselves, then we will never see the miracle. We will never trust God to provide. That's step three, be selfless. Don't count the cost, trust God to provide. Have a look at verse 18. And Jesus said, bring the fish and the bread here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Well, what have we discovered today? We've discovered, I think, sympathy costs us nothing, normally just leaves the person feeling judged. Empathy, there is a cost. We need to feel what they feel. Our emotions are affected. But it usually makes the person feel validated and heard. And compassion, compassion. Short of our salvation, there is no limit to what our compassion may cost us. And isn't that a scary thought? Short of our salvation, there is no limit to what being compassionate may cost us. And I think this is why intellectual people struggle so dearly to be compassionate. I think it's why when you see these, (laughs) I won't name Bill Gates, but when you see these people set up these foundations to help and serve others, wonderful thing, of course, but why do they do a separate business, a separate company, a separate entity? Because they want to make sure their compassion doesn't affect their lifestyle. They're only giving from their excess. And that's not compassion at all. Compassion is hard. Compassion costs us something. But for the person receiving, compassion is everything. The person receiving what we are unable to share, it is everything. They feel valuable, important, heard, and loved. Compassion's powerful. It changes lives. I don't, and the, think, I don't think you can give compassion without being picky, so that's fine. There's layers of compassion. Yeah. Compassion. It's powerful. It changes lives. And I'm not just talking about the recipient. Imagine what would happen if our disciples took Jesus at his word. Imagine if they were selfless, if they ignored the cost and just did what he said. Surely the miracle would have still happened. But what do you think would have happened to their faith as they stepped in 
thinking, well, we're just gonna go without like the crowd. What do you think would have happened to their faith? I reckon their faith would have moved mountains after that day. Of course, we know it took Jesus' death and resurrection before their faith took that step and began to move mountains. Last thing, do we think we've got the faith to be compassionate, to be selfless, to help without counting the cost? So often we offer to pray for people and if we're not careful, praying for someone can just be sympathy, can't it? Just be a simple response, yeah, I'll pray for that, maybe I'll remember, maybe I won't. It's sympathy, it costs us nothing. Prayer can be empathetic as well. We can pray for someone and really kind of feel their situation. Maybe we've been through something similar and that often drives us to pray more about whatever's going on. But imagine if we were compassionate to those we're praying for. What would that look like? That would be something, wouldn't it? Maybe we too would end up with the compassion that can raise the dead. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You challenge us to be like you. You change us to be like you. You grow us into your likeness. If we are willing. Lord Jesus, we are willing. Build your church. Grow our faith. This we pray. Amen.